Welcome to In the Life. I'm Michael Billy. The American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or DSM, is the Bible of mental illness. Among its nearly 300 entries is Gender Identity Disorder, a diagnosis applied to every transgender person who enters the healthcare system, a classification that is necessary to securing vital treatment, but that for some carries an undue stigma. Tonight on In the Life, producer and former host Catherine Linton examines the controversy raging over whether or not gender identity disorder will be included in the next edition of the DSM. Ten years ago for In the Life, I traveled to Toronto, Canada to interview Dr. Kenneth Zucker, head of the Child and Adolescent Gender Identity Clinic at Toronto Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. Dr. Zucker works primarily with children under the age of 10 who've been given that diagnosis of gender identity disorder, defined as a mental disorder. His therapies and positions on gender variant children were highly controversial then as they are now. Dr. Zucker has stated that his goal in treating children is to make them more content in their biological gender. And one of his methods for diagnosis and treatment is toy play. Well, if you right. study the toy play of boys and girls or dress-up play, there are very substantial differences between boys and girls. Here's a Ken doll. Is that a boy doll or a girl doll? A boy. Put this skirt on this doll. Now, is it a boy or a girl? A girl. How come it's a girl? Because it has a dress. Boys don't put on girls' clothes? No. Can <laughs> girls put on boys' clothes? No. What would happen if you put on a dress? All the girls and all the boys will laugh at me. For years, Dr. Zucker has come under fire from activists and many experts for practicing what they see as reparative therapy for gender variant children and for his view that adult transsexualism is, quote, a bad outcome. So imagine the surprise when last May, the American Psychiatric Association announced the appointment of Dr. Zucker as chair of the work group assigned to examine the gender identity diagnosis in the virtual Bible of mental disorders, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. As soon as the news about the DSM subcommittee, uh, you know, hits the hit the public, it was just instantaneously spread across uh, the internet through all these networks of transgender people from one part of this country to the other. I found out through a uh, email blast um, that had begun when people were sending out the information of who had been selected. I immediately was sort of taken aback by the selection of Kenneth Zucker, you know, being. You know, he's kind of like the boogeyman to me, in a way. It seemed alarming to me that they would select a person who I think has historically not had our best interests at heart. When people found out that this was who was going to be in the leadership uh, of the revision process, there was an explosion of activism. I think it took the APA very much by surprise. The APA released a statement immediately defending its selection of the committee. But to understand the trans community's concern over the committee and the potential revision of gender identity disorder is to understand the importance of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual and the history of GID. The DSM is used worldwide. It's certainly the standard for psychiatric diagnosis in the United States. It's also used by a lot of other agencies, particularly the federal government, uh, the FDA, the NIH. Insurance companies also looked at the DSM. Insurance companies and also the publicly funded insurance programs, Medicare and Medicaid, also use the DSM diagnoses as the standard for um, reimbursement for psychiatric treatments. Gender identity disorder was first introduced into the DSM version three in 1980 seven years after the gay community celebrated the removal of homosexuality from the manual. Few took notice at first, but almost immediately, many were being treated for GID. I have a copy of a handwritten note from my doctor, you know, stating that I had gender identity disorder present since grade three. We had one 15-minute meeting, and that was my primary diagnosis. And this, coincidentally, is just as gender identity disorder is invented and the first edition without homosexuality.
When Daphne Shalinsky was 15 years old, she suffered severe depression due to multiple issues. When her parents went to a therapist for advice, they were told they had one option, to lock her in a psychiatric facility. But rather than being treated for depression, gender became the immediate focus of the doctors. It was like this barrage of just constantly, you know, like dripping water on my forehead over and over and over again. You're wrong, you're bad, you're ugly, and you're crazy. Daphne, now Dylan, would spend three years locked up and treated for gender identity disorder. As more stories like Dylan's got out, with the help of books like Gender Shock and Dylan's own, The Last Time I Wore a Dress, the LGBT community began organizing and demanding the removal of the diagnosis from the DSM. But that unified demand was cut short when the diagnosis was revised in the 1994 release of the DSM 4, suddenly pitting the interests of gender variant children against access to health care for adults. When they combined GID in children and transsexualism into one diagnosis, it created a major rift within our community after having gained so much momentum in movement towards change. It took our focus off of the psychiatric system and onto each other. Children and adults are quite different because although the diagnosis in adults presumes a good degree of stability that that person who has gender dysphoria will remain gender dysphoric for a long time, with children that's not necessarily the case. So it's very difficult to lump all of them together. While many recognize how the diagnosis can be damaging to children, Many adults require the GID diagnosis to attain access to certain health care. Outright removal, some are concerned, could threaten this access. A lot of transgender people need transgender-specific care. In order to be allowed to access that care and to have that care paid for by private or public insurance plans, it's necessary for there to be a diagnosis on which to base the treatment we must have some sort of medical diagnosis, and there's just no question about that. It would be devastating. It would be a disaster. The trouble for many is that GID is classified as a psychiatric illness, which for many, like Dr. Christine McGinn, who works primarily with transgender patients, still carries the potential for stigma or discrimination. It is a double-edged sword because, um, you know, myself, as a personal story, every time I apply for privileges at a hospital, I have to fill out an application and they specifically ask me if I have any psychiatric diagnosis. So, although I had to go through the therapy process to get my surgery, I don't feel as if I have a psychiatric illness and I'm quite functional. <laughs> it saddens me every time, frankly, that I have to fill that out. The way that the diagnosis as it stands now is harmful is that it actually is saying that their gender identity is disordered when in fact what's disordered is their brain identity and phenotypically how they present or their body is incongruent. The primary concern about the GID diagnosis is that it pathologizes from a mental health perspective a medical condition. If something can be fixed with a physical transformation, then it shouldn't be categorized as a mental health condition. The challenge then for the revision process for the DSM-5 working group is how to potentially reform GID and address concerns over treatment of children, stigmatizing language, and adult access to health care. I think that the APA is working with the disease concept, right? They're medical folks, they're psychiatric folks, and we don't think gender identity is a disorder. So we'd like to see it removed from the DSM, but only with the assurance that trans people and gender non-conforming people can get the services that they need. Without a doubt, we're in a dilemma because we, on the one hand, need the diagnosis. On the other hand, the diagnosis uh, facilitates abuse, mistreatment, and misperceptions of transgender people. There's definitely things that can be done to, to improve the way the diagnosis is worded to mitigate some of the potential for misuse and stigma. That's going to help a lot. However, many advocates for GID reform, even removal, are still very concerned about the review process and potential revision. Oh, I think everybody's terrified right now. I don't think anybody's watching, just watching cautiously. I think that people are very concerned that they're going to throw in more pathology. Some of the fears around the DSM-5 is 
based on history. From the beginning of GID to the, its current state, it's become a more dangerous diagnosis that, rather than a safer one. And to go and put Kenneth Zucker in charge of like the next inception of it just is terrifying because you could just imagine, you know, that the next level is just, like, how can it get worse? We'd of course like, you know, a better DSM. We'd like a more open process. We'd like a committee that reflects the practice and the movement that the psychiatric community has made in the last 20 years. The DSM-5 will not be released until 2012, and as of now, the APA has not expanded the working group, but promises the process will at some point be opened up for review. And in regards to concerns over treatment, have appointed a diverse group to examine treatment practices for GID. The APA also encourages people to visit their website to follow any developments on the revision of the DSM-5.